ASIS here, PSIS, Mission Tuberosity, Trochanta, we've established, here's our sacrum. Um, if we do piriformis, so piriformis is running from the anterior aspect of the lateral border of the sacrum between S2 and S4, which means it's inside, it's inside there, like that. In fact, it's got splits to let the uh, nerves run through, and then it's running over here like that. So there's your, there's your piriformis over here like this, but it's actually quite a bit smaller than this, it doesn't look this big. So it's not this big in its lateral aspect, it's pretty, pretty narrow. It, it, it narrows down quite rapidly because it's like kind of pear-shaped. Okay, so that's that there. Now immediately underneath this here, from the um, inferior lateral angle of the sacrum here to the spine of the issue, <coughs> you've got the sacrospinous ligament there. So the sacrospinous ligament cuts the uh, sciatic notch into the greater sciatic foramen there. And as I said the other day, if you've got a greater sciatic foramen, you've got a lesser sciatic foramen. Um, so that there becomes the lesser sciatic foramen there, okay? Now that's formed by the sacrospinous ligament and the sacrotuberous ligament, giving you that there. Now we're going to come back to the relevance of these two neurologically in a moment, but for, the mo for now we'll just stick on with the muscle. So um, in line with the sacrospinous ligament, you've got a muscle here called coccygeus, which is running between here and here, okay? And Adjacent to coccygeus and immediately underneath piriformis here, you've got this one here. So which one is underneath piriformis? If we're moving from the top to the bottom, we've got pear shaped and square shaped. Jumellus, yeah. So it's jumellus superior, yeah, there. Which is running across this groove here in line with co uh, coccygeus. So piriformis here, immediately underneath, so this fan going down here, we've got jumellus here. Now, this is important, this bit of bone is important. The spine of the ischium, because it creates this um, um, space here, the greater and lesser sciatic foramen, what happens is out of here comes obturator internus. So obturator foramen in here attaches internal to the obturator foramen there, and it's running out of here like that, and it's running to the back of the trochanter there like that. So that's obturator internus. So let me span it out inside. Occupies a bit of space inside the pelvis there, if you can see that. Obturator internus, it cannot be above that bone, okay? It can't, the bone's telling it where it's going to go. So it's here, there it is, obturator internus. Now immediately underneath that, what have we got? What's the other twin? Inferior. Yeah, inferior, so jumellus inferior there, <laughs> isn't it? Now there's only one muscle underneath this now, inferior to it, because it's the bottom of like the book ends. We've got pear shape, we've got? Square, square shaped. Yeah. So we've got quadratus femoris there, haven't we? Big square fella there, like that as its name suggests. So you know it's broad because it wants to be square and so its distance across here is fairly equal to its thickness. And this is running from the inferior aspects of the ischial tuberosity upwards. So you know it's occupying most of this space down here. Okay. Now we've left one out because it's external to the group, it's obturator externus. So that's gonna take us around to the external obturator foramen here. There's the obturator foramen, it's attaching to the obturator foramen on the outside and it's running over here like this. So you can see why we can't see it from the back, can't you? Because it's actually coming from the front to the back. And as a result, quadratus femoris is gonna be over the top of it here. So it's in, it's in its way really, so it's coming underneath. Now the interesting thing, obviously, that's obturator externus, external rotator, obturator internus. Now don't get confused about this. The internus is telling you its location, not its action. It's an external rotator because it's pulling back this way. If you're unsure of what a muscle does, all you need to do is look at where A and B are, okay? All a muscle can do is shorten the distance between A and B in a straight line, unless something else acts upon it. In a straight line, that's it, that's all it does, unless something else acts upon it, okay? And that's an important thing to remember, because sometimes something else acts upon that muscle, and that changes things. If you know where A and B are, in a sense, you can work out every single exercise to strengthen anything because all an exercise does is shorten A and B under load, that's it. If you want to increase the range of movement between A and B, you know every stretch. To stretch a muscle, just increase the distance between A and B, that's it. So now you know every exercise, every, every uh, stretching movement, because if you know A and B, it tells it you. Why? Because anatomy dictates technique. So that's what you need to know, which is why if you start to understand anatomy, not only do you understand um, you know, your objective assessment, your differential diagnosis, and your subjective, of course, as well. But you start to understand your treatments, you know, your manual therapy, your needling. What am I trying to do here? Remember what I said earlier at the back? Why would you go deep? 
Well, deep is gonna increase range of movement, it's gonna release it. Do I wanna increase range of movement? It depends, what's the problem? It's like a flow chart, that's all it is. Your decision making is a flow chart. Do I want this, do I want this? Okay, I want this. If I do this, do I want this or this? Same, same sort of thing. So once you start to understand this, it makes your life easier. So where's the sciatic nerve? Because that's a concern, isn't it? Bone's gonna tell you. You've got some options. We've got S2, S3, S4. Okay, it can't come out S2 because there's bone here. Okay, it cannot go through the bone, so it must come through the notch here, through the space here, or over here. It's coming out of here. Okay, because that notch there is for the muscle to run through, like that. So it's coming out here around about S3-ish. And where's it going? Well, it, it can't go through that ligament here. So it must come out of this space here. Now, where does it want to go? It want to, wants to run down the back of the leg. So it's got to get down the back of the leg. And when it gets to the back of the leg here, one branch is going to go uh, between the condyles. The other branch is going to go lateral. So the nerve wants to move lateral anyway. So it's got three options at the issue. It can go medial, it can lie on top of it, it can go lateral, okay? Let's remove what it can't be. It's not gonna go over it. If it did, you'd get a neuropraxia every time you sat down. So it's not going over it, so we got rid of that. It could go medial, but its problem with medial is it now needs to bank around that to get lateral. So where do you think it's going? It's running lateral, because that's its easiest path. Mm -hmm. It's a path of least resistance, that's what it's gonna do. It's gonna run lateral across there. So now we know where the sciatic nerve is. If you know where the bone is, you know where the nerve is. Why? Because it doesn't have a choice. Same thing as the muscle, same thing as the tendons, the ligaments, the nerves, the arteries, the veins, they don't have a choice. Um, the bone makes it so. So that's the anatomy around the hip, as far as your tissue paper anatomy is concerned. One last thing I should tell you, why uh, obturator internus is the new piriformis, although don't quote me on that, is that's obturator internus there. Seems okay, until you understand what else goes on here? So, from here, this is the uh, inferior lateral angle of the sacrum, down to here, okay? So we've already got coccygeus over here, and we've already got the sacrospinous ligament. What we've also got running across here as well, and also coming down onto the coccyx here, but coming over and just touching on here, is a muscle group called levator anae. And levator anae has three components. It's iliococcygeus, pubococcygeus, and puborectalis. It's telling you where it's going. So there's three muscles there, okay? They're combined <coughs> together to form like a single functional unit, which forms half of the um, pelvic floor on one side and on the other side. So you've actually got three muscles in two pairs, six muscles working together, joined together with a ligament from the coccyx to the rectum, so the rectal coccyx lig uh, ligaments, and then you've got the apertures of the pelvic floor and then the muscles are joined to each other. And what they're doing from here, and you might think, well, you're not a pelvic health physio, so I'm not interested, but it will be relevant to you. So it's running from here, and as it moves forward, it's running through the front of the pelvis here, and they're attaching here to the pubic rami, there, and they're attaching the back here. So you've got this like sling. The issue is though, they haven't got an attachment here on the bone, but what they have got is an attachment to obturator internus. So you can't move the pelvic floor without affecting the hip. You can't affect the hip without moving the pelvic floor because the muscle pulls in a straight line unless something acts upon it and they're acting upon each other. So if one gets traumatized or dysfunctional from childbirth, could be hip injury, you know, one direction or the other direction, it will affect it. And so what you'll get is dysfunction and pain in the lower hip, depending on the history, you know, um, I, I did this with a, a, a pelvic health physio the other day, they were consulting on a treatment for somebody, and I predicted the nature of the symptoms and the activity of the individual, um, and which structure would be involved. Why? Because it's, you can predict it from, from the anatomy, it's just pattern recognition, that's all it is. Um, it was a cyclist, and um, his problem was obturator internus, not piriformis, because the chances of it being that were even greater, so it's easier to predict because of levator A and his impact on obturator internus in the, in the saddle. He's gonna do it all the time. You're much more likely to be that. It's the most obvious answer if you understand the anatomy than piriformis um, because of the impact on the pelvic floor. Um, so 